Hello and welcome to the DecisionWise Engaging People podcast. My name is Charles Rogel. I work as the Vice President of Consulting Services here at DecisionWise. Today I am joined by Jefferson McLean. Hey, good to be here with you, Charles. Jefferson is the Director of Data Science and Research here at DecisionWise, and I'll let him explain in a moment what that means. The topic today in our ongoing kind of series around manager best practices is that of decision making. So today we're going to talk about our research on decision making as well as how to make how to be good at decision making and give you some more insights on this topic. So Jefferson, you want to explain yourself and also our topic today? Oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, so, Director of Data Science and Research, one of those is easier to explain than the other. Research, right, we do a lot of surveys with different companies, and I go through, analyze their results, look at things more on a on a large scale, right? So, mm-hmm. whereas an organization might have only a couple hundred managers in our database, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of managers so that I can go analyze, see what trends are, see where we're going in 360 norms and stuff, see what's really influencing high scores or low scores, but also the data science. And and the reason why this is really interesting to talk about this with decision making is in data science, there's a lot of different algorithms or methodology you're you're trying to use to optimize decisions, Mm -hmm. right? And sometimes those decisions in the statistical sense can almost become true false statements, right? If this, then I'm going to do this, or if this, I'm going to do that. But the real challenge is when we get into the real world and we're with our managers or we're with our, the people we work with, and it's not always such a, okay, if my manager says this, then I do that, or if the people I direct say this, I do. It gets a little bit more in it's the gray messy. area. Yeah, yeah, messy. So we've got some different items in our business leader and executive leader 360s that we use to look at your decision making abilities. Abilities, yeah, yeah I guess practice. that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so some of them uh, shows good judgment when making decisions, uh-huh. seeks input of members when making important decisions, make decisions that reflect a clear understanding of what we do in our organization. And then we also have a couple other ones that are looking at a little bit differently, the why behind actions or decisions rather than just the how or the what. And that, you know, is going to be crucial to our conversation today, along with willing to make the tough decisions. So those are the kind of the five items that we usually hang around when looking at how someone makes these So we're evaluating it at at lots of different angles to kind of understand decision-making capability or abilities. So once we have this feedback and we're looking at this and someone's saying, yeah, my decision-making scores are a little bit lower, I can see one or two areas I need to improve, where then do we say, like, how can someone go about actioning on this and improving on decision-making? Oh, great question. I think the beginning uh, stage is what you need to do is almost reframe the way you're looking at making decisions, mm-hmm. right? A lot of us, when we're trying to make a decision, it, like purchasing a car, right? Or maybe even more simple, let's just go to the grocery store first. Go get some groceries. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to go to the grocery store and you'll be like, oh, you know, I need some fruits and vegetables. And if we're trying to be really healthy, you know, pass by the candy aisle or whatever. But then sometimes when you're going to the grocery store, you'll also see like, oh, hey, this is right here accessible. Soda, yeah, I'll just throw one in the cart. Yeah. Well, if you look at decision as, as an event instead of as a process, then it becomes really difficult to and try to improve, right? Because it's almost like, Every decision is just flipping a coin. But there's a a branch of philosophy called process philosophy made by the big tenants of it are Alfred Whitehead and Charles Hartshorn. They're trying to, their explanation of the world and how it works is that instead of static events happening, the, the reality is made up of small moments, almost atoms or molecules of moments that all lead up to one another. It's really a kind of high level way to think about it is if someone's playing a, a piano piece, right? If, if they start with the first note, there's nothing really unique about that note, but that first note leads into the second note, which then leads into the third note. And pretty soon you're into this melody with this song and these other themes and these motifs that are going throughout the whole piece. And if you look at your decision-making process like that, right, we're trying to understand where the the processes are and where you are in the process that you're doing really well at, Mm -hmm. and maybe where in the process you need to do some improving. Okay. So it's kind of a building type of piece. Yeah, totally. And and the first place that I start, uh, especially as, as I'm analyzing data or working with people, the first place I usually start is, right, what are my inputs? 
what, what data is going into the model or what do I already know about the situation? And I really turn that inputs into kind of two different categories. There's the external and the internal inputs. Mm -hmm. If I'm a manager trying to make a decision, those external inputs could be advice from uh, higher up leadership. They could be information from the people that you direct. Could be you're looking outside of some industry experts, right? Trying to create this organizational change. What do the in industry experts say? What are things that I should be doing? What are pitfalls I should avoid? It could also be from your organization's culture, yeah. right? I'm sure you, as you've consulted, you've seen lots of organizations where, hey, this is kind of the the way we make decisions here. Yeah. And if you as a manager are trying to go around that, it can be really troublesome. But then there's also, right, internal inputs. And that's kind of, I guess the tool set I already have inside of me, right? What's my experience? What's my training or education? What, if, what has life led me to already to believe would be the right thing to do? What's my gut telling me? And, and by the way, lots of research says, be careful with your gut, right? Especially if you've eaten something squishy or whatever. <laughs> but especially when making hard decisions, your gut can be right, but you want to make sure that there's some external validation out there so it's not just your inherent biases yeah. really clouding that judgment. Yeah, and it's interesting, too, because as you say, as you're making more of a collaborative decision, the upside is, you know, a lot of times more people will be right about something. But in some cases, if they all don't have experience in something, they can be wrong. Yeah. Or it leads to groupthink, and we tend to just kind of mm -hmm. go along with the with the norm. Yeah, it, it almost becomes right. If you're a, a fish in the sea, do you follow the school of fish? Do you go on your own? Mm -hmm. How do you figure it out? One really good resource that I've seen to kind of help explain this whole process from beginning to end yeah. is, I believe it was the 1957 film. I don't know if that year's right, but uh, 12 Angry Men. Sure. Classic. Oh, yeah. And and for those of our listeners who, who maybe haven't seen it before or who weren't blessed with that opportunity, we'll say, <laughs> it's a black and white film about this 12-man jury who they just got done seeing the, the case against a young man who supposedly killed someone, mm -hmm. and they now need to go deliberate and make a decision. So they all walk in, and all of them are kind of like, hey, this is a cold case, you know, smoking gun kind open type shot. of deal, open, uh -huh. yeah. And they go around, and everyone says, okay, he's guilty, 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 till, of course, the last man, and he says, not guilty. Yeah. And the rest of this film shows this process between inputs, the external inputs from the, from the case and the internal inputs of what do I think, what's my experience with the world, and how these 12, we could call them jurors, but in, in other ways they could be managers or a board of executives at an organization. The process that they're going through to finally come to a, well, I guess we won't tell you what the final decision right. was <laughs> so that you can go watch it, high quality. Right. Um, but I'm not sure that when we think of decision making in a 360 context, we're always thinking about that entire process. Well, it's funny because I think we, we tend to cling to one of the different areas, whether it be our experience, education. Sometimes we defer to coworkers or a boss too much. And so we might rely on one input too uh, extensively, which yeah. might lead to a bad decision. Well, it can not only lead to a bad decision, right, but that inherently will, will bring a heavy bias into whatever decision you yeah, make. Yeah, right. Which, which, which you're right, which would lead to, lead to bad decisions. And, and hopefully it doesn't lead to further bad decisions along the road. Mm -hmm. Some other things that we need to be careful of or be cognizant of, especially as we're looking at these competencies, is that the decision-making is highly correlated with a, a couple of the other competencies that we look at. And yeah. most of these, you're going to see them and you'll be like, Oh, wow, that's groundbreaking. I would have never thought that before. <laughs> Sorry for the sarcasm. Actually, no, it, it, it mm -hmm. makes sense. Very straightforward, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> One of them being a interpersonal communication, right? If you're trying to make good decisions, then it makes sense that you need to establish good, effective two-way communication with others. Sure. Or share information in a way that's clear and concise or be open to feedback. If you're not good at communicating with others, then good luck making the results of your decision right come to pass. Because as yeah. a manager, you can go be like, here's a decision, and then I'm not going to communicate it to anyone. You'll get frustrated, and they'll get frustrated. Yeah. I'm sure so you've seen that Listening probably. is part of that communication, too. Yes, definitely. Huge part. And listening actually ties into the, really the, the next one that's highly correlated, and that's psychological safety. Mm -hmm. Right? Do those who I manage or do those who I work with, do they feel safe coming to me, talking about 
the different ideas or maybe even struggles or challenges that they're finding in the workplace where you need to make a tough decision yep. to figure out what to do or what your next steps are. Yep. Change management. I feel like we've already kind of touched on that one. With it. It's kind of the overarching theme, I would feel like, for most everything. Right, yeah, because change management kind of causes decisions to need to be made in yeah. a way. So so now are you kind of being more re- reactive to changes that are coming your way and have to make decisions and, and, and pivot? Or are you a change agent and you're pushing for decisions to be made and, and trying to make things you know better? Yeah. Now, the, the next one, collaboration, once again, kind of touches on, on lots of touch points with decision making. But Charles, I don't know if I've shared this with you before, but we've done research on the employee experience. Uh-huh. And we found that only 56% of employees are satisfied with their level of involvement in decisions that directly affect them. Yeah. <laughs> That's not good news. It's really common because as a manager, a lot of times you feel like it's your job to make decisions, like that's what you're getting paid for. Yeah. And if you defer or if you rely too much on your people or maybe you're talking, you know, trying to get too much information from your manager, you may feel like you're giving up that power. And so you want to be careful to kind of protect your turf sometimes, be assertive. But that can also shut down good decision-making because now you're relying on yourself. Exactly. And actually, almost the opposite is really what you want. Instead of taking all that power, you want that. The the last element in our 360 that's really correlated is empowerment. You know, when we talk about these 56% of employees who are satisfied with their level of involvement, so those, what, 44% that aren't, that level of involvement doesn't necessarily need to be me as a manager going and saying, hey, what do you think should be done? And that might be somewhere where we often go to, right? If I'm going to involve someone in the decision-making process, I need to ask them, what would you do in this choice? Yeah, yeah. And I don't think that's necessarily always the, the case or would be most prudent to do. There are other ways to involve others in the decision-making process that can really help them. One of them is how is that rolled out to others. If you're going to have a huge organizational meeting, do lots and lots of changes like we talked about earlier, it might be really beneficial to sit down and talk with some of the key influencers or key individuals who are going to be crucial to getting kind of political buy-in for this new change that you're, you're making. Yeah, and it gets back to one of the first questions we use to measure this is sharing the why behind decisions as opposed to the what. So context, like you mentioned, ties into that. In fact, that that why can be so crucial because a lot of the time decisions can appear a lot like statistics we see on billboards, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's kind of like, okay, sure, 9 out of 10 dentists recommend this brand of toothpaste. But where do they come from? Did you give them the toothpaste? <laughs> right. Why are you making this decision? Why didn't you involve me? Who paid for the study? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Is this just so that you look better as a manager? Yeah. <laughs> or are you really trying to empower your whole team through your decisions to make it so that not only you, but but everyone else's water rises. Yeah, and it's interesting because there's there's kind of a balance there. I mean, you want to be collaborative. You want to bring people in. You get you you're able to gain buy-in support for decisions that way. But at the same time, if you're always collaborative, your team members might be saying, "Geez, just make the decision. We don't care. We just need you to to make the decision so we know where to go. Give us the direction." Sometimes we overexercise in one of those two areas, and it can be disruptive or frustrating for people either way. Oh, yeah. Think of a professional baseball player, right, who's going up to hit. Mm-hmm. And every time he turns back to his coach, sh- should I swing on this one? Should- <laughs> yeah, right. What do you guys think? Dug out? Like- yeah. And I was going to say the other thing is, you know, to your point about, you know, gathering information, it doesn't hurt as long as – usually I say – you know, state your intent. If you want to discuss, if you have a decision to make and you're looking for a sounding board from someone to kind of process your ideas, then say, hey, I need a sounding board. Can you just sit there and listen to me and give me some ideas or feedback on this? And you can do that with your manager or other people. But sometimes I say, don't always go to your manager because they might be feeling you want them to make the decision unless you're clear about your intent. So they might be saying, hey, you're deferring to me for decisions too often. I need you to own this and run with it and and come to me with your solution. So Generally, I say look for a partner, mentor, somebody else you can kind of bounce ideas off of as well. And even with your direct report, sometimes you have to be careful. If you're not sure about your decision, they might also perceive that as a weakness in that, you know, you fumble or you you don't have, you know, a good direction or something like that. So to a point, there is some politics involved in, in that process. And Charles, as someone who's done hundreds of 360s, 
Yeah. Not yeah. for yourself, right. but, but helped others with <laughs> debrief. With debriefs. Yeah. yeah. What are some of the, I guess, some of the pitfalls you see or some of the really s- cool successes that you've seen? Yeah. You know, it's funny because we'll talk about it and we'll look at these questions and I'll just say, well, tell me how decisions are made and how you think through it and what's your, what's your approach typically. And people say, well, I'm really collaborative or, you know, sometimes I, I get overpowered, you know, analysis paralysis. There's, you know, it's a big decision. I don't want to mess it up or I, I take too long. And so we talk through through some of those things. Well, what is it? Did you feel just not confident or do you feel a little unsure? You're afraid to make a mistake. So sometimes we have our own hangups and our own insecurities that kind of play into this. And so, you know, then you just need to kind of talk. And I always say, it's really good to kind of open up, talk to people, think through it. Sometimes even with your manager, you can say, how, are, how do you perceive me making decisions? And where do you want me to be more assertive or less assertive? And, and the good decision makers out there really use a balance, right? And so they can kind of look at topics and issues and say, this is a collaborative decision we need to make. And this is one that I need to make a call on. So you have to kind of categorize your opportunities a bit as you approach them and then decide the best way. Empowering your team, you know, pushing decision making down certain levels is also great that empowerment piece you talked about before so yeah it's a situational kind of deal yeah one comment that you're talking about right if people get stuck in this i have too much information analysis paralysis there's a really cool book out there called algorithms to live by and it's by uh, brian christian and tom griffiths and they go through a lot of algorithms that are used in computer sciences and even some in data science and talk about how can we apply these to our everyday life. Yeah. One of the first chapters talks about how to know when you've collected enough information and when to move forward. Sure. And what they suggest is you spend 37% of your time making and collecting information. And then after that information collection phase, the moment you see something that is better than what you saw during that collection phase, you jump on. Hmm. And I'm sure you're like, okay, Jefferson, like, how are we going to figure out what 37% of right? my time like, is? Like, <laughs> like, am I going to sit out here and like do an Excel spreadsheet with timing or anything? Sounds like something you would say. <laughs> but, but their suggestion, right, is let's say you have to make a decision as a manager and you know that you have one month to do it. Yeah. Take that month, divide it into uh, in thirds. thirds. Yeah, basically thirds. And then take the first third and just mull around, get all the information, get all the ideas. Mm -hmm. And then after that first third of the month, the moment you have the the next greatest idea of of what to do or the moment it all comes together, go and act on that decision. Yeah, so there there comes to a point you just have to call the shot. Exactly. And and to your point, you know, this this idea of this journey or or path, how did you describe it at the beginning? Process. Process, yeah. yeah, Is, again, don't be so prideful that you need to hold on to that decision. Just say, hey, we're navigating this, and Mm -hmm. we might pivot a bit as we go. But you definitely want to kind of allow yourself to modify as you proceed. Ideally, uh, you're making good decisions, and those good decisions don't just end all decisions there on. Mm -hmm. It's leading to better decisions in the future. Exactly. Well, Jefferson, thank you very much for all the cool research and insight into decision-making. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Visit us on our website at decisionwise.com. We have a ton of resources, articles, podcasts, as well as videos on several topics around best manager practices. And we look forward to having you join us on a future podcast. Thanks, everyone.